Okay, great. We got it on the screen. Hallelujah. I got tickled at Greg a few minutes ago. I went over to him after he spoke and told him that he had knocked a home run and that really appreciated what he had to say. And he said, well, I must admit that I was a little nervous speaking about Bible prophecy with you in the audience. And I said, that's nothing compared to the first time I got up to speak Bible prophecy. And I looked out and saw Tim LaHaye in the audience. <laughs> Reminds me of the fellow who was one of the survivors of the great Jonestown flood in Pennsylvania in the early 20th century. And he spent the rest of his life boring people to death telling them about the flood. And every time he told it, the flood got wider, it got deeper, more people were killed, fewer people survived until finally he was the only survivor. And uh, despite all of his exaggerations, he did go to heaven when he died. He was covered by the grace of God. So when he got up there, St. Peter said, Brother, we want to make you feel at home, so what can we do for you? He said, Get me an audience. I want to tell them about the Jonestown flood. <laughs> so three days later, St. Peter called him and said, We're ready. And so he led him out on the stage and he looked out and he had never seen so many people in his life. He said, How many people are here? He said, Two and a half million. He said, well, this is just wonderful. So the St. Peter got up, introduced him, and as he walked up to the podium, St. Peter turned to him and said, oh, by the way, I think you should know that Noah is in the audience. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I, I just can't begin to tell you how much I have appreciated this time here at this church and all of the fellowship, the great music, uh, the preaching. Uh, I, uh, and, and the story of this church, I mean a church that 18 years ago had what 50, 60 members now has 700 growing like mad, built great building like this. Uh, it shows you what happens when you focus on preaching the Word of God and not trying to uh, get in bed with the world and make the world happy. That's what's happening in Christianity today all across this nation is churches are more interested in being accepted and approved by the world than they are by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as I said today in the question and answer period, the number one question we receive at our ministry almost every day is, do you know of a Bible-believing church in my area? And uh, they're just hard to find anymore. And so, I praise God for this church, and I pray that the Lord will continue to bless it in its outreach here and throughout this state and around this nation. Well, I have each time reminded you that we have a television program called Christ in Prophecy, and if you can't find it on some of the channels we're broadcasting on, you can go find it on our website, and uh, we, we archive all our programs there, and you can watch it on demand. You can also sign up for our uh, magazine, The Lamplighter. This is a cover of the very latest edition by a great Israeli artist, and this is an uh, his uh, concept of the third temple which will exist during the tribulation period. And I wrote the main article about Jewish preparations for the Messiah. And so uh, that magazine is free of charge if you just want to get it, the digital copy by, uh, by email. Uh, there is a charge if you want to get the uh, published copy, the printed copy. But either way you can sign up at our website. Now tonight I'm going to be talking about death. So I thought that I would start off by sharing with you some of the most famous tomb tombstone epitaphs that have, I've ever run across. And some of these are absolutely unbelievable. They're from the United States and from England. For example, this one, Harry Edsel Smith of Albany, New York. And here's what it says on his tombstone. Looked up the elevator shaft to see if the car was on the way down. It was. In Thermont, Maryland Cemetery, here lies an atheist, all dressed up and nowhere to go. <laughs> On the grave of Ezekiel Akel in a cemetery in Nova Scotia, here lies Ezekiel Akel, age 102. Only the good die young. <laughs> in London, England Cemetery, here lies Anne Mann who lived an old maid, but died an old man. <laughs> Here's one in Ribsford, England. It says, Anna Wallace, the children of Israel wanted bread, and the Lord sent them manna. Clark Wallace wanted a wife, and the devil sent him manna. <laughs> Rio Dosa, New Mexico. Here lies Johnny Yeast, pardon him for not rising. 
Here's one in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, stepped on the gas instead of the brake. <laughs> Here's one in Silver City, Nevada. Here lies the kid. He, we planted him raw. He was quick on the trigger, but slow on the draw. <laughs> Wimborne, England, the grave of John Penny. Reader, if cash you are in want of any, dig six feet down and you'll find a penny. <laughs> Man, a lot. And this one is in Hartscombe, England. On the 26th, uh, 22nd of June, Jonathan Fiddle went out of tune. <laughs> Nantucket, Massachusetts. Under the sod and under the trees lies the body of Jonathan Pease. He is not here. He's only a pod. Pease shelled out and went to God. <laughs> Here's one in England. It says, remember man as you walk by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so shall you be. Remember this and follow me. And then one day somebody wrote this on the tombstone. To follow you, I will not consent until I know which way you went. <laughs> in a cemetery in Massachusetts, here lies Matthew Mudd. Death did him no hurt. When alive, he was only mud, but now he's only dirt. <laughs> and here is the tombstone of Martha, Luther, Martin Luther King, Jr. All it says on it is, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. And in an Italian cemetery is this tombstone. Promo Levi. One, seven, four, five, one, seven. His number at Auschwitz. And then one of the most beautiful of all epitaphs, one written by Benjamin Franklin for himself. And this is on his tomb. The body of Benjamin Franklin printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents worn out and script of its lettering and gilding, lies here, food for worms. Yet the work itself shall not be lost, for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more beautiful edition, corrected and amended by its author. And then my favorite, photographed at the garden tomb in Jerusalem, Jesus Christ declared with power to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, and on the door of the tomb, he is not here, for he is risen. Hallelujah. So I want to speak to you this evening about what happens when you die. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and thank you so much for the way you have blessed us so much this evening by this wonderful music, by rich fellowship, and by the preaching that we've heard. And now we pray for you to anoint this message that we might better understand what happens after death and in the process be drawn deeper into your word and into a deeper personal relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you live in fear of death? The vast majority of mankind lives in fear of death. And it's interesting that in Hebrews 2.15 it says that Jesus came to this earth for the purpose of delivering those who live in lifelong slavery to the fear of death. Many people live in that slavery today. There's no doubt about that. But what is tragic is the number of Christians who do so also, due mainly to their lack of knowledge of Bible prophecy. For you see, my friends, if you believe what the Bible teaches about what happens after death. If you know that what happens because you know Bible prophecy, then you will never fear death. Consider what Paul wrote in Romans 8:18. 8, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. What a mouthful. Because I know that every person here this evening knows someone who is suffering mightily from heart disease, from cancer, from Parkinson's, MS, diabetes, depression, dementia. You know someone like that. And this says it doesn't matter what you suffer in this life. It is nothing compared to the glory that is going to be revealed to us. That's a mouthful. So let's look at some questions concerning death. 
some of the most frequently asked questions about death. And the first one always is, what happens the moment that you die? Do you go to be with the Lord or does your soul sleep? I grew up in a church that taught that the moment you died, your soul went to sleep. You were put into a grave and you laid there in that grave for eons of time, unconscious, waiting for the Lord to return. And when the Lord came back, the whole world blew up. You were resurrected and you became a spirit being floating around in a cloud playing a harp. I couldn't get excited about that. I just, nothing about it excited me. In fact, when I was 12 years old, and I'd hear that sermon, I'd go home, get in the closet, and die laughing. And let me tell you why. I grew up in a church that believed that the worst thing you could possibly do was to play a musical instrument during a worship service. And we believed that all Baptist pianists were going to go to the deepest, darkest part of hell and burn forever and ever because they played that piano in a worship service. And our preachers would get up and preach hell, fire, and brimstone sermons against musical instruments. And then they would turn around and say, but you're going to spend eternity floating around in a cloud playing a harp. And I thought, we can't play one here, but we're going to play one forever in heaven. It just made no sense to me. And it made no sense because it was utter nonsense. There is no such thing as soul sleep. Let me talk, uh, to, uh, prove that to you. For example, the Scriptures teach that the moment that you die, that your spirit, if, if you are a believer, if you have been born again by faith in Jesus Christ, that your spirit will be ushered by the angels into the presence of Almighty God. The moment you die. Jesus said this in Luke 16, 22. It came about that when the poor man died, he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. So, this is, uh, this is to be expected because it says in Hebrews 1, 14, that angels are ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. Regarding soul sleep, there simply is no such thing as I said before. It's true that the Bible often refers to death as sleep. You'll see that many times. But that term is used in reference to the body and not to the spirit or to the soul. The reason is that, as we shall see, it refers to the body because one day that dead body is going to be awakened and it's going to come back together. It doesn't matter if it's been cremated, if the worms have eaten it, if it's... Uh, 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 has disintegrated in the ocean. It doesn't matter. It's going to come back together. The one who spoke and the whole universe came into existence is going to speak and all those bodies are going to come back together. And the souls are going to put, be put back in those bodies. The spirit does not sleep. The body sleeps at death. And that's the reason that term is used. Consider what the Apostle Paul had wrote in Philippians chapter 1. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. For that's so much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Now notice what he's saying here. He's saying I'm, I'm just being torn apart by this because what I really want to do is go be with the Lord. But, but I know I need to serve Him here so I'll serve Him here as long as I have to serve Him here. But I want to go be with the Lord. To die is to gain. Is it gain to lie in a, in a tomb unconscious for eons of time? No. He had no idea of soul sleep. No idea of something like that. To die was to be with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 8. I prefer to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. The moment you die, your spirit is ushered into the presence of God by His angels. Now, I want to pause here for a moment to make a theological point. And don't let that scare you. Sometimes people hear the word theology and their eyeballs roll back up in their head. But this is not going to be that way. So just hang on here for a moment. I want to make a very important point. And that is that it has all not, always not been true that when a believer died their spirit went to be with the Lord. That has only been true since the cross. Before the cross the situation was very different. Before the cross here's what happened. Jesus teaches this in the book of Luke. At the time of death before the cross, the spirits of the dead all went to the same place. Whether you're a believer or unbeliever, you went to a place called Sheol in the Old Testament and Hades in the New Testament. Those words, one is a Hebrew word, one is a Greek word, they refer to the same place. It's a holding place for the spirits of the dead. And there were two compartments in Hades. Hades is not hell. 
There was two compartments in Hades, one called Paradise, which was the holding place of the spirits of the saved, and one called Torments, which was the holding place of the spirits of the unsaved. And between them was an abyss which no one could cross. And we know all of this from the story that Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus. You all know that story in Luke 16. So, that when the rich man died, his spirit went to Hades. When the uh, uh, other man died, his spirit went to Hades. But the rich man's went to torments, and the other man, Lazarus, his went to that place called paradise. Now, according to Jesus' story, they could see each other. They were perfectly conscious. There was no such thing as soul sleep. Their spirits were there. They could see each other. They could talk to each other. They could not cross the abyss. Now, this raises a major question. Why is it that before the cross the spirits of the saved went to Hades rather than to heaven? Well, the reason is that their sins were covered by their faith, but their sins were not forgiven. And since their sins were not forgiven, they could not be ushered into the presence of a holy God. Their sins were only covered by their faith, not forgiven. Hebrews 9.22 says, According to the law, things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. There had not been the shedding of blood for their sins. They had simply practiced animal sacrifices. And all those old sacrifices covered their sins, they did not forgive their sins because there was not the shedding of blood of a perfect human being. You see, there had to be the perfect human being, one who had never sinned, to die for the sins of mankind. When I was a kid, I heard over and over the statement, uh, the, the blood of Jesus saves you. And I had no idea what that meant. I just trusted the people who said it. But, but one day I realized that what it was talking about is it says the wages of sin is death. We die because we sin. And the only person who ever lived a perfect life was Jesus Christ. So that when He died, He died consciously of His own will. He died not because of His sins. He died because of my sins and your sins and the sins of the world. And so they had to wait for that perfect person to die. Hebrews 9, 11 through 16 says that the blood of animals is insufficient to purify anyone from sin and that our purification from sin can only come from the blood of Christ who through eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God. And that is exactly what happened when Jesus was hanging on the cross. He died for our sins. And you remember what he said to the person who put his faith in Jesus? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. He was not speaking of heaven. He was speaking of that compartment in Hades called paradise. But here's the interesting thing about that. We're told that when Jesus was resurrected that He descended into Hades. Not hell, but Hades. So, He descended into Hades. We're told that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19. Then in Ephesians 4, 8 we're told that when Jesus ascended on high He led a host of captives with Him. What that means is that when Jesus ascended He emptied paradise because now the sins of those people were not only covered, they were completely forgiven. We're told in Ephesians and in 1 Peter that when He descended into Hades He made an announcement. But we're not told what the announcement was. I'm pretty sure I know what the announcement was. The announcement was the blood has been shed. And there must have been a great shout of hallelujah. And then He ascended into heaven and took with Him all of those in paradise whose sins were now not only covered but forgiven. And since that day every time a believer dies a believer's spirit goes directly to heaven because when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior our sins are not only covered, they are completely forgiven because of the blood that He shed on the cross. Hallelujah. Now we know for certain that paradise was moved from Hades to heaven because in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2 Paul wrote these words, I know a man in Christ speaking of himself who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. The first heaven is the atmosphere of this planet. The second heaven is outer space. The third heaven is where God resides. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, was caught up to paradise. And I heard in inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. Now notice, he equates the third heaven where God resides with paradise. So paradise was moved from Hades to heaven and therefore again, Every time a person dies today, if they are an unbeliever, their spirits still go to Hades. They still go to that compartment called torments. 
But today, believers, when they die, their spirits go to heaven immediately to be with the Lord. So if you have a loved one like I had who died, who was in the Lord Jesus Christ, their spirit immediately was ushered into the presence of the Lord, and that's where they are now in heaven with Him. Okay. Now, let's go back to frequently asked questions about the death, uh, about death. When we arrive in heaven, will we be disembodied spirits? Which is what I was taught. And that's, this is nothing in the world but Eastern religion like Hinduism that has invaded the West and created a concept that heaven is an ethereal place of spirits who are disembodied floating around in clouds playing harps. Well, the answer to this question is a big no. We will have what theologians call an intermediate spirit body. The moment that you die, your spirit is issued into heaven and you receive an intermediate spirit body. Why is it called that? It's a body between the mortal body we have now and the immortal body that we will receive at the time of our resurrection. We were never created to be bodiless. So we have a mortal body now. After death we receive an intermediate spirit body and then when we're resurrected from the dead, we're, God takes our spirit, puts it back together with our bodies, and we become immortal. So three bodies, the current body, mortal, the intermediate spirit body, and then the immortal body. Meaning it will be intermediate between our current mortal body and our ultimate immortal body, which we will receive at the time of the resurrection. Now the evidence of this, again, is overwhelming throughout the Bible. For example, do you remember when Paul went, I mean Saul went to the uh, witch at Endor and he asked her to bring up her uh, familiar spirit to tell him whether or not he was going to win a victory in the battle the next day? And so she did all of her hocus pocus and who appeared? Samuel. And she recognized him and Saul recognized him and Samuel was in some sort of intermediate spirit body and he spoke to Saul and said you know that it's against God's law for you to call up spirits of the dead and because you've done this you will be killed in the battle tomorrow. Second, do you remember at the transfiguration that while Jesus was being transfigured and His disciples were showing His glory that He had left in heaven, suddenly Elijah and Moses appeared and began to talk with them. Elijah and Moses were in some sort of intermediate spirit bodies. Or in the book of Revelation, we're told in Revelation that the tribulation martyrs, millions of them, or under the throne of God wearing white robes. They had some sort of body. They're wearing white robes. They have an intermediate spirit body. I could give you other examples, but these three are some of the most important ones. We know from the story I've already told you about, the rich man and Lazarus. They had some sort of intermediate spirit body after their, after their death. And they could see each other, recognize each other, and talk to each other. So we have an intermediate spirit body. This brings us to another question. When does the resurrection of church age saints take place? When is it most likely going to take place? Well, I believe it's going to be in the rapture of the church, which I believe is going to occur before the tribulation begins. I'm certainly praying for that, but I believe it's going to occur before the tribulation begins. And so we find this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where it says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. That's a reference to the dead to their dead bodies, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in the Lord Jesus Christ. What a day that will be. And then he continues. He says, I want you to know something. Jesus will bring with Him the spirits of those who have died, it says. Died with faith in Him. It is the body that is in the grave sleeping in the sense that it is awaiting an awakening. And Paul proceeds to describe the awakening now. Here's the awakening. He says in the next verse, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those bodies are going to come back together. He's going to bring their spirits with Him. He's going to put their spirits together with their bodies. And just like that they will become immortal. And then the good news for us then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Wow, 
I've always been told there's two things that nobody can avoid, and that is death and taxes. Well, the only thing that you cannot avoid is taxes, because there's going to be a whole generation of people, could very well be us, who will never experience death. That when the rapture occurs, we will be taken up, and on the way up, we will be translated. We will be uh, changed from mortal to immortal on the way up without even experiencing death. And <laughs> I can hardly wait. <laughs> I, uh, and so, the last verse, the last verse in this passage is this one, comfort one another with these words. And boy, that's a comfort. You know, we had a speaker called Ron Rhodes. Ron Rhodes is a great Bible prophecy teacher. And we had uh, Ron in a, uh, uh, a conference of ours, and he was speaking about the pre-tribulation rapture, and he was defending uh, the pre-tribulation rapture. And so, <laughs> Uh, he, he got up and he said, you know, there, these people who say that the church is going to go through the tribulation, let me, let, let me just explain that to you. What they're saying is this, you're going to go in the tribulation, you're going to be hunted down like animals, you're going to be tortured, you're going to be crucified, you're going to be slaughtered right and left, you're going to be living off the land uh, like an animal for seven years. Comfort one another with these words. <laughs> he said, folks, it just does not work. So, a summary here. A trumpet will blow, an archangel will shout, Jesus will appear in the heavens bringing with Him the spirits of the dead saints. He will resurrect their bodies, reunite their spirits with their bodies, glorify their bodies. He will then catch up all believers and glorify them. Next question. What is a glorified body? Well, this is a good question. I'm asked this all the time. And the Bible reveals that a glorified body is one that's going to have some very distinctive characteristics. One, the bodies will be perfect. They will be perfect. Look at this in Isaiah 35. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will, deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. I had a step-grandson named Jason, who at the age of three began acting very strangely, and by the time he was four years old, he was beating his head against walls, uh, putting his fist through walls. It was just unbelievable. What the, the, the boy could not allow anybody to touch him. Uh, he uh, lost his speech, and, and uh, he was finally diagnosed with some, some uh, autoimmune disease about that long, and they said it was one of the rarest of all. It skips one generation after another. We went back and did some ancestry look work and discovered that every generation it had skipped, and that uh, uh, what had happened was that they thought they were just insane and put him in an insane asylum. They said he would not live beyond the age of 12. He had to wear a helmet all the time. He had to be put in a padded room. Nobody could touch him. He had to, uh, he had to have, uh, be put to sleep uh, uh, for, uh, in order to have his teeth worked on or anything. His mother could not touch him. Nobody could hold him. It was unbelievable. And he lived to the age of 30. I wrote two books that I dedicated to him. And in both of those books I said, I'm dedicating this to Jason because I know that one day when the Lord comes back, Jason's body will be resurrected, his spirit will be put with it, and his mind will be set right. And I'll have all eternity to fellowship with him. I can hardly wait. My wife in her last nine years suffered from dementia. And I know that one day I'll see her again and her mind will be set back right. I can hardly wait. That's what the glorified body is all about. It's going to be perfected. It's going to be immortal. There will never again be any back pains. There will never be again any allergies, uh, no, pain, no diseases, nothing of that nature. We're going to have an immortal body, a body that will live forever and ever and ever. Look at this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with His body of glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. Paul wrote about a glorified body in 1 Corinthians 15. Almost the entire chapter is about a glorified body. But by the time you get through reading it, you have more questions than you had when you began. This is the best description I've ever read of a glorified body. We're going to have bodies like the body of Jesus after His resurrection. It was a body you could see. It was a body you could recognize. It was a body you could touch. It was a body, though, that had a, 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 an extra dimension to it. An extra dimension. In his body, he could, for example, appear uh, in a. Uh, uh, he could appear when uh, uh, 
out of nowhere in a locked room. Suddenly he's there. Suddenly he's gone. Suddenly he's in Jerusalem. Then he's in Galilee. He seemed to move at the speed of light from one place to another. We're, it says we're going to have a body like his. Our bodies, glorified bodies, will be tangible. They will be recognizable. They will be perfected. They will be immortal, but with a special new dimension. As he, again, he, uh, this is one of the things I love about his glorified body. He ate in his glorified body. Uh, we, uh, we have many examples of him eating. He ate with his disciples several times. He ate with them on the uh, uh, shores of the Sea of Galilee. It, it, was, it was wonderful. And, and I have this fantasy uh, that we will be able to eat all that we want to eat and not have to worry about gaining one ounce in our glorified immortal bodies. That's why I get up every morning and shout, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come quickly. <laughs> I want you to notice a couple of things about his body then. He is pictured not only eating but his wounds still existed in his glorified body. His wounds still existed. They could see the pierced hands. They could see the pierced side. I believe those wounds will be in his body eternally to remind us of the price that was paid for our salvation. And I look forward to that day when I can stand in front of him and I can clasp his nail printed hands and look in his eyes and say, thank you for going to the cross for me. Thank you for dying for me. What a day that will be. And I think every one of us are going to have that opportunity. Another question. What happens after we arrive in heaven after the rapture? Well, it's good news and bad news. And that is that when we arrive in heaven after the rapture, we're going to be immediately judged by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the good news is we're going to be in heaven. We're going to have the guarantee of, uh, of immortal life uh, with, with God the Father and God the Son. But the bad news is there's going to be a judgment, not of your sins. No, not of your sins. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgotten when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But there's going to be a judgment because on the day that you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, on the day you're born again, you receive at least one spiritual gift, at least one. You may receive more than one. And along the way, if you're a good steward of those gifts, you may receive additional gifts. And what Jesus is going to do, we're going to stand before him and he's going to say, now here are the spiritual gifts that I gave you. How did you use those to advance my kingdom? And that's going to be the judgment because there's going to be degrees of reward. All the saved will receive immortal life. But we're going to receive degrees of reward Different crowns, different types of robes, different types of medals. There's going to be degrees of reward. And though we're told that the, the judgment will be on how we use the reward, uh, uh, how we used our, our spiritual gift, uh, the quantity of, of, of work, the quality of work, and then the motivation of work. And that motivation is going to catch a lot of people unaware. I, I, I really believe that, there, uh, that as we're, uh, when we witness this uh, judgment, we're going to see some world-renowned evangelists that all of us have heard about. And, and the Lord's going to say, on the day you were born again, I gave you the gift of evangelism. Use you mightily, mightily to advance my kingdom all over the world. But I knew your motive. And your motive was you wanted to become famous. You wanted to have your picture on the front of Time magazine. And so here's your reward. Your picture on the front of Time magazine. And then he's going to call up some little old lady in tennis shoes that nobody ever heard of. And he's going to say, dear, on the day you were born again, I gave you the gift of hospitality, the spiritual gift of hospitality. And you used it mightily to advance my kingdom. Every time somebody was sick, you were the first one there. When there was a death, you were the one arranging the meals. And, and he'd just go on and on and on. And give her a crown so full of jewels, she'll have a neck ache throughout eternity. Yeah, you know. I, I just really believe that's going to happen. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Incidentally, the word bad there is not talking about evil things. It's talking about the quality of what they did. Uh, when you did uh, work, did you do it for Jesus Christ? Did you do it in his name? Or did you do it to bring honor and glory to yourself? So there's going to be all kinds of rewards handed out. And what a day that will be. 2 Timothy 4 verse 7 says that each one of us who lives looking for Jesus, and I know many people here this evening, I know them personally, are living looking for Jesus. He says here, if you live looking for the Lord Jesus Christ, if you live with an eternal perspective, you're going to receive a special reward. 
I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, this is Paul speaking, but also to all who have loved His appearing. And then after all the rewards are handed out, all the rewards, then we are going to sit down and we are going to celebrate the greatest feast in the history of the cosmos. It will be a feast celebrating the fact that the bridegroom has now been brought together with the groom. The union has occurred. The celebration has occurred. I mean, the, the, the wedding has, it's time for the wedding. It's time for the wedding feast. And so the wedding feast of the Lamb will occur in the greatest feast in the history of the cosmos. And we will celebrate our union with Jesus Christ. And at the end of that feast, he's going to stand up and he's going to say, Okay, let's go. Let's go. And he will return to this earth and we will come with him. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. And so, we will break from the heavens with the Lord Jesus Christ. When does the second coming occur? Well, the second coming occurs, the answer immediately after the marriage feast. We will break from the heavens with Jesus. We will come back with Him. Most Christians I find are not aware of that. They don't understand that we're going to return with Him. But proof of that can be found in Revelation 19. Look at what it says here. Let us rejoice and be glad. We just read this and we'll read it again. And give glory to Him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then skip to verse 14. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean were following Him on white horses. I always thought that was talking about angels. Yes, angels will come. But look, that's talking about believers. Because in verse 8 it says the believers will be in fine linen bright and clean. And then in verse 14 it says those in fine linen white and clean are going to be following Him on white horses. We are going to come back with the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be there on the day when He lands on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. And that place breaks open. We will be there when that happens. We will be there when He speaks the supernatural word and the armies surrounding Jerusalem are destroyed. We will be there that day when we see Him coronated the King of kings and Lord of lords. As I said the other night, this is going to be a replay in His life. It's going to be deja vu all over again. And that is that once before He came to Jerusalem, He came on a donkey as you see in this great uh, painting here. He came on a donkey and people hailed Him, Hosanna to the Son of David, Hosanna to the Son of God. And a week later many of them were saying, crucify Him, crucify Him. He's going to replay that. This time He's going to land not on a donkey. He's going to come on a white war charger which is the symbol in Roman times of a victorious general. And then He's going to ride down into that Kidron Valley and then hundreds of millions of saints in glorified bodies are going to fill the valley and the sky above. Many of us will be hovering above as He goes down. And we will be singing, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the Son of God. What a day that will be. I get goosebumps every time I sing a song that has the word Hosanna in it. Because I know I'm preparing for that day. And then He's going to ride up to that eastern gate. He's going to ride... He's going to break from the heavens like in this glorious picture here. He's going to land on that Mount of Olives. The Jewish people are going to come out and they're going to receive Him as Messiah. They're going to cry out, Baruch Baba Shem Adonai, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. And then he's going, to, he's going to ride down into that valley. He's going to ride up to that eastern gate, that gate that has been closed for over 400 years, almost 500 now. The Bible says in Ezekiel 44, the eastern gate will be closed. And it was closed. 500 years ago. The only gate of Jerusalem closed. Fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And it says it will never be open until the Messiah returns. That's what Psalm 24 is about. Look what Psalm 24 says. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. We will see Him walk right up to that gate. It will blow open. He will go up to the Temple Mount, and we will watch as He is coronated the 
King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he begins his reign over all the earth. David is resurrected to serve as the King of Israel. We in our glorified bodies are scattered all over this world to serve as uh, uh, as uh, uh, to, to re- uh, reign with the Lord Jesus Christ, to reign over those who are in the flesh, because every person who gets to the end of the tribulation in the flesh who has accepted Jesus Christ will be allowed to go into the millennial reign. And those who have rejected Jesus who live to the end will be consigned to hell. Last question here, what happens after the second coming? What happens after the second coming? Well, the answer is that the Lord inaugurates His millennial reign. And here is how it's described in Zechariah 14. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, and the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when He fights on a day of battle. In that day His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west by a very large valley. And the Lord will become King over all the earth. In that day the Lord will be the only one and His name the only one. And look at the promise that Daniel gives concerning this. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man, the Messiah, was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, God the Father, and presented himself before him. And to him, to Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. And if you think that's good news, look what else he has to say. He says, and the the saints, that's you and me, the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. And then the sovereignty, the dominion, the greatness of all the kingdoms of the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and the dominions will serve and obey Him. We're going to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Praise God. Hallelujah. I love this painting of the millennium. There is Jerusalem lifted up. Did you know it says that when Jesus returns the greatest earthquake in history will occur and that every mountain will be lowered and every valley will be lifted up and the earth will be like a plain except it says that the city of Jerusalem will be lifted up and leaves the impression it will be the highest point on planet earth. And from there Jesus will reign in His glory and people will come from all over the world to worship Him and honor Him. And in the front you see beating swords into plowshares. In the middle, the wolf lies down with the lamb. On the right, a little boy playing with a poisonous snake because the snakes will no longer be poisonous because all of God's creation will be returned to the way it was at the beginning and all of the animals will live in peace with one another and with man. It says a little boy will have a lion as a pet because they will no longer be vicious. The lion will eat straw with the ox. What a day that's going to be. Oh, what a day it's going to be. Frequently asked questions, what happens to us when the Lord's thousand year reign comes to an end? What happens then? Well, what the Bible teaches is that we are going to be taken off this earth and we're going to be put in that new Jerusalem that Greg preached about, that Jesus has been preparing for the last 2,000 years. Can you imagine what that's going to be? You can't even imagine. It's beyond, beyond imagination. We will be put into that great and glorious city in our new bodies, in a new city. And I think from that vantage point we're going to watch the greatest fireworks display in all of history as this earth is superheated and all of the pollution of Satan's last revolt is burned away. And then we are going to be lowered down in our new bodies in the new Jerusalem to the new earth where we're going to live in the presence of God forever and ever. Frequently asked questions, where will we live eternally? In heaven? No. Well, the answer actually is yes and no. And why do I say yes or no? Because we are not going to live in an ethereal place called heaven. We're going to live here on this earth that has been renovated, refreshed, renewed, perfected, probably much larger in size than this earth is now. We're, that's where we're going to live. But, but wherever God is, is heaven. 
And it says God is going to come down to earth, not us go up to live with Him, but He's going to come down to earth and He's going to live in that new city with us. So heaven is going to be moved to earth. So yes, we're going to live in heaven, but heaven's going to be on a new earth. And I can prove that to you from Revelation chapter 21. Look what He says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, and made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and He shall dwell among them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself will be among them. God is coming to earth to reign among us forever and ever. And He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any death, there shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And He said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. And He said to me, It is done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the Beginning the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water without cost. And he who overcomes shall inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. What a day that will be. Amen. Today in the question and answer period I'm pointed point that every promise in the book of Revelation, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Every promise that's made is made to the overcomer. He who overcomes shall inherit these things. And I will be his God, he'll be my son. So what is the definition of an overcomer? I want to be an overcomer. I think you do too. Let's look at the definition. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And who is the one who, is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You become an overcomer and you become an heir to all of the promises that are made. Frequently asked questions, what will be our activities in heaven? It doesn't tell us much about that. It tells us a lot about the millennium, but very little. But what it tells us is so exciting, it's unbelievable. First it says, we shall see the face of God. The Bible says no one has ever seen the face of God. Moses viewed the backside of God. We're going to see His face. You know what I think that means? It means we're going to have intimacy, intimate fellowship with our Creator forever and ever and ever. What more could you ask for? It says that we will be His bondservants and we will serve Him. I could go on all day about what I think that means. For one thing I think may be that God is going to greatly amplify our talents and our our gifts so that singers will sing as they've never sung before and reach those notes they always wish they could. Poets will write without difficulty great poetry all to the honor and glory of Jesus that painters will paint as they've never painted before. I just think there's going to be so much that we will be able to do. I, I have all kinds of fantasies about it. I can hardly wait to be in a worship service that's led by David King David who wrote the Psalms and leads us in a worship service. Or to study the book of John with John teaching the book of John. I believe that in our glorified bodies we're going to be able to go out, in, and, and Bob Russell mentioned this, this the other night, I don't know if you caught it or not, but I, I believe that in our glorified bodies we will be out, able to go out and see all of the glories of God's created universe without a spaceship, just guided tours in our glorified bodies. Well, let me conclude by telling you my what I believe is going to be the sequence of end time events. We'll start with the day of Pentecost when the church was established. We are now in the church age. It's lasted 1900 years plus. We do not know for certain how long it's going to last. We're not told. But we know from the signs of the times that we're near the end. It's going to be followed by a short period of time of seven years called the Great Tribulation, the most horrific period in the history of mankind. Notice the church age, I've got these little cross lines on there that indicates the line is not drawn to scale. And so, seven years of the tribulation. That's going to be the worst time in the history of the world because when the great flood occurred, at least people died pretty fast. But during the tribulation, there's going to be death going on, an unparalleled death. By the middle of the tribulation, one half of all the population of the earth will be dead. That's how bad it's going to be. Jesus said, if I don't stop this at the end of seven years, there'd be no one left. All people would be dead. That's going to be followed by the millennium of 1,000 years, 
of peace, righteousness, and justice on this earth. That's going to be followed by eternity on a new earth. I think the church age is going to come to a screeching halt when Jesus appears in the heaven and the rapture of the church occurs. We will be in heaven during the tribulation receiving our rewards and celebrating our union with our bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. We will return to with Him at the end of the tribulation and we will reign with Him for a thousand years and then spend eternity on that new earth with Him and the Father. What a day that's going to be. First the rapture, then the second coming. The second coming actually occurs in two stages. And so I want to end as I begin. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Or to put it another way, written also by Paul, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has the mind of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, These troubles and sufferings of ours are after all quite small and won't last very long. Yet this short time of distress will result in God's richest blessings upon us forever and ever. So we do not look at what we can see now, the troubles all around us, but we look forward to the joys in heaven which we have not yet seen. The troubles will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and Maranatha, come quickly Lord Jesus.